time talking about soils, um, leaving some manure to some comments at the end, since we've already had some good manure talk today with Craig. Uh, so why are we doing the soil testing? Why are we collecting samples? Um, the goal is to get an idea of the soil's fertility. Um, and that's important because it tells us whether or not we're going to be able to grow plants or crops um, profitably. And if not, what it is that we need to add to the soil um, to make up for what we're missing. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to know if we're gonna make extra money by applying fertilizer or specific nutrients to specific fields. Um, so by doing this work prior to the season, we can get an idea of how to maximize our profits um, and potentially minimize the waste uh, of nutrients for financial and for environmental concerns. So the main things we're gonna be looking for are macronutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, um, and then soil pH. So pH is gonna be a big one. We're gonna spend a good amount of time talking about that. Um, and there are four steps to this whole process from sampling to laboratory stuff to interpreting and then actually applying those results um, as recommendations. Um, and it's very important that we understand kind of the theory and ideas behind these protocols that go into our sample collection or extraction, uh, because if we don't, we can make errors uh, that end up kind of making our, our whole nutrient planning useless because we have bad data, bad recommendations mean waste of time and money. So the first thing, and this is probably the most important thing, um, is the soil collection itself. So it's challenging because we're gonna go out there, we're gonna collect maybe a soil sample bag worth of soil. And that soil sample needs to represent an entire field. And when we talk about just a single acre and we look at you know, the upper six inches or the plow layer, we're looking at 2 million pounds of soil. So you know, maybe a pound of soil is sent to the lab and that needs to represent 2 million pounds of soil. Um, so if we get that wrong, if we send a soil sample that's not representative, everything down the road is going to be off and this is going to just be it's not going to be a useful exercise so that's why we need to understand how to collect our samples so that they are representative so the first approach um, in a traditional approach to collecting soil samples um, we call it the unbiased composite sampling uh, basically what that means unbiased is that in some way shape or form we try to randomly select where we take our soil samples from our field um, the kind of traditional method is to basically just draw a line, um, you know, a zigzagging line across your field, and then choose a set interval to collect samples from along that line. In this way, you're kind of covering the majority of the area of the field, and you're not picking certain spots for any particular reason. They're not yield-based. Um, you don't pick spots because you like them more or you know something about their history. Because at the end of this, we're going to combine all of these samples into one bucket, mix them together, and then send them off to the lab for analysis. Uh, in terms of number of cores, number of samples, we roughly want to get 15 to 20 cores per field. Um, and this does kind of scale up as we get through larger fields. We can usually bring back the number of cores. Uh, but there are a lot of different considerations that we'll go over in determining the number of cores. And the number of cores is really important um, because it will ultimately affect the accuracy and the reliability of our results. Um, you notice on this graph, when we only have, you know, zero, five, 10 cores to represent our entire field, we see a lot of variability in our results. Um, so, you know, if we're thinking about, well, we only took five samples and we found out that our soil stress parameter was 55. The next year we could take another five samples and it might be down here at 35. As you increase the number of samples from your field, you'll get closer and closer to that true number. So if we can get more samples, we'll get better numbers, and those numbers will help us make better nutrient management decisions. Now, the flip side of that is, you know, we're making these decisions to increase the profitability of the farm, to decrease nutrient waste, but with more samples comes more time, comes more energy, comes more money. So we're kind of, wanting to balance the amount of effort with the, you know, the, the output and the reliability of our results. 
Um, so a more precise approach um, is called grid point sampling. Um, we break up our field into subunits, just draw lines basically across the field, and wherever they intersect, um, we will take a composite sample. So that's where we take, you know, six or seven soil cores, mix them together, and then that sample will represent one intersection. Um, so then we can go throughout the field and collect samples at each intersection, and that gives us an ability to create uh, basically maps um, that show us, well, we've got high phosphorus up here, we've got low nitrogen over here, um, and this can be really useful for our variable rate applications. Uh, this type of sampling is better used in um, very variable fields where you have a lot of different areas, maybe historically different management practices, um, and that a single data point like you get in a composite sample or traditional phase sample is not going to be able to recognize and account for that variation. Um, this is much more sampling intensive. Um, so an important consideration when you're deciding whether or not to do grid point sampling is whether or not you're going to be able to make use of this data. Um, if you do not have the capabilities to do fine scale or variable rate application, um, the increased resolution of the data you get may not be all that useful. Uh, that being said, you don't need to do this every five years. If you have a new field, you use this sampling approach, you're going to have a very good understanding of how the nutrients are spread out in the field, and you'll be able to make some good decisions down the road. So to go over some examples, um, we have these two sites in Frederick, Maryland that we've been studying. Um, site one, three acres broken up into 18 grids. Site two, we've got 12 grids. Um, and we went out and we sampled these at a couple of different depths. Um, so now I'll show you the results. So this is the larger field. Um, we've got 18 different grid points. Um, and we're looking at malic free phosphorus levels. Um, so each one on the horizontal axis is a different grid. This is our phosphorus value. So we look at our average across all our uh, grids. We get 33.1 milligrams per kilogram. Um, which in our like Maryland index of soil fertility falls in the medium range. But what I really want to point out to you is the, the range. So we're between 22 and 53, low to medium in terms of that fertility index. Um, and while the axis here is stretched out a little bit, really the difference between your lowest points and your highest points is only 30 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and in terms of your management recommendations, that's all in the low to medium. So in this case, we've done all the sampling. We collected tons of samples, got all these data points. And in the end, we're probably going to just need to apply phosphorus to every plot of this field. These data points are relatively uniform. In this case, since we have a uniform field, it may be better to apply a traditional composite-based sampling approach because you don't need to spend all that time to come up with all of this data, when in the end you're just going to apply phosphorus at probably a standard rate. On the other hand, um, in this field, notice our axis is different. We have 200 up here. Um, so at our lowest point, we have 34 milligrams per kilogram. At our highest, we're at 187. So we have a really, really extreme range. There's a lot of variability in this field. But if you look at our average, we're at 91.6, so that's optima. We wouldn't want to necessarily put any phosphorus on this field. So coming back to that traditional grid-based sampling approach, if we had gone through the field, taken one core at all these different locations, put them all together, had them analyzed, the results would have said your field, your entire field is perfect. You don't need to add any phosphorus this year. But in reality, we look down here and we're deficient potentially. We're kind of lower than optima up, up here. And then we're also excessive. So we wouldn't know about our excess points. We wouldn't know where we're actually a little bit low on phosphorus. Um, so in this case, it's really good to have that precision mapping approach. Because then we can say, OK, these grids, we're going to add phosphorus. We can lay off over here. Um, and then this kind of data would be represented for potassium, for pH, things like that. So you'd have a lot of information that you could make very good, fine-scale decisions based on. So switching over from thinking about the field as kind of horizontal flat surface um, to this three-dimensional soil layer, uh, depending on what 
the field is used for, how it's been managed in the past, we'll want to target different soil, soil sampling depths. There'll be different interests based on what the field is going to be used for. So, you know, if we think about a crop field that's no till or just maybe pasture land where you're not rotating or agitating that soil very often, um, we really only need to be looking at the top two inches, especially since we're probably mostly interested in our pH in these conditions. Um, with our pH management practices, generally, we're not going to see a lot of things changing below that top surface layer. Whereas if we're thinking more like we want to do basic soil fertility testing, we're going to be planting corn or soy, we want to get deeper into the soil layers and see what's happening um, because that's going to be more relevant to the practices that we're employing. And then on the more extreme end of depth, if you're going to do something like a pre citrus nitrate test, um, you know, with nitrate being a bit more volatile of a chemical, could potentially sink down deeper into the soil profile, we'll want to look at deeper depths. So that's just another important consideration. We got to consider where we're going to take our samples, how deep we're going to take our samples. Um, some kind of more just like, you're looking at your field, what can I know, what do I know about this field? If you know that you have problem areas, whether they are waterlogged or for whatever reason, you just never get good yield. Like in these two images, just lawns, we've got dead grass, for whatever reason, it's not growing. This is not something that you want to sample and then include in your composite sample. You know, you don't really know what's going on, but you know it's not good. You know it's not really representative of the rest of the field. So if you include it in your composite, you'll end up pulling those results in one way or the other, and it'll kind of make the information less valuable to the rest of your field. Um, you can definitely submit a separate sample. You know, just grab a sample from right here, send that off to the lab by itself, and then you'll know what's going on, and you'll see if, if you can do anything about that. Um, another consideration, um, when should you take a sample? So there's some obvious things. You can't take samples when the ground is frozen. Um, it's really difficult to sample when it's very wet. Uh, for, you know, just it's, it's a pain to put the sample in a bag or a container. It's harder for the lab to analyze. It's harder to ship. Um, so we want to stay away from wet. We want to stay away from frozen. Um, you know, over the course of the year, our test results will vary repeatedly. So we have one thing you want to do is just try to take your samples at the same time every year. Uh, whether that's fall or spring, you just want to make a habit out of it. Uh, all things considered, fall tends to be a, a really good time. The weather is good, uh, but you generally have a lot of time to make uh, a nutrient management plan after you get your test results. Um, you can also avoid some of the lab backups that might occur in the spring when everybody's sending their samples in. So there's a lot of advantages to, to doing it in the fall. Um, we have tons of these fact sheets all over the University of Maryland Extension page um, that give you a lot of specific guidance, um, kind of troubleshooting, um, you know, very like step-by-step -step guides to doing this. Um, so definitely check out these resources, especially as you're going out making these plans. Um, to kind of double check and walk through all the considerations. So now that's done. That's the most important part of this whole thing. That's where most of the error can come from. Um, now you're going to go to the part where there is the least error. Uh, generally, um, the lab process is very reproducible. Um, the only thing you really need to consider in terms of lab is that they're using regionally appropriate methods. So the way we analyze our soils um, kind of depends on what type of soils we have, what climates they're exposed to. I mean, these things vary regionally. So I wouldn't want to take my soil samples from here in Maryland and send them to a lab in, say, Iowa, where their extractants and their results are calibrated to different standards. You know, in Iowa, they have lower phosphorus requirements for corn than they do in Maryland. So you want to make sure, you know, you're thinking regionally appropriate. Um, and then you also want to make sure that the lab is quality, that they follow good quality control measures, um, and one way to make sure that the lab is good is you can check their uh, proficiency testing programs. There are some nationalized uh, programs that will go into labs, make sure that they're following procedure, following protocol, and they will give you essentially a stamp of approval that says this lab is certified and is good. 
And these labs will not be secretive about their uh, proficiency testing status. If they're doing this testing, they will tell you and they want you to know, and you should ask them, like what proficiency testing programs do you go through? Um, and if they're doing them, they'll say, yes, look at this, we do all these things. So you should definitely come to us. If they don't, they might be a little bit more secretive and that's when you know, okay, maybe we shouldn't be sending our samples to this lab. Um, so, you know, you send your sample in, they're gonna run a battery of tests looking at a bunch of different things. Um, the main things are always gonna be pH and exchangeable acidity. So that's like, you know, how much lime we might need if your pH is off. Um, our extractable nutrients. So this does not include nitrogen, um, but does include the other major nutrients that we've been talking about. Um, cation exchange capacity and base saturation, so more soil characteristics. Um, and then there's always options for additional information, additional tests. You can look at different micronutrients. Um, you can have the lab write up a nitrate report, organic matter, soil texture, um, but these things are not necessarily gonna be included in a standard fertility test. Uh, but you may be interested in those results as well. So the first one, soil pH, um, you know, generally this is an incredibly important soil chemical property um, because everything else we're interested in, all our nutrient availabilities and our cation exchange capacities are going to be affected by the pH. If the pH is off, everything else below that is going to be affected and your test results and your recommendations and applications are not going to be very effective. Um, on top of that, you know, we'll look at mineral solubility, microbes will behave differently, um, and again, our nutrients will be more or less available, most likely less available. So over time, soil pH decreases, especially up here in the Northeast where we have temperate environments, humid, lots of rainfall. Um, you know, we get, we get actually extra hydrogen ions from rain, which will increase the acidity or decrease the pH naturally. That rain will also wash away other cations that act as like a base or a buffer in the soil. Um, plants produce acids to help mobilize nutrients in the soil. So they are actively working to make the soil more acidic kind of for their own short-term benefits. Um, plants are also creating CO2 through natural respiration in the roots. And that CO2 will combine to what with water, chemical reaction, you end up with like carbonic acid. Um, and so, Again, more de uh, pH decreases. And then nitrogen fertilizers. You know, urea and ammonium are these nitrogen forms um, with three hydrogens that end up in the soil. So just the addition of our fertilizers decrease the pH. So we have a lot of different factors that are going to be affecting pH, hence why we test for it, and hence why we want to control it. Um, so this is kind of a cool graph that just shows you an example of how nutrient availability changes with pH. Uh, this green block is the ideal pH range. And you'll notice that for most of these major nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, they're thickest in the green block. And as you go away, you get narrow and narrower. Like I mean, just for an extreme example, at a base of 10, aluminum is not available at all. Uh, nitrogen is great between six and seven. As you decrease or increase, it becomes less and less available. We don't really worry about high pH so much up here. It's more of a problem in like the American Southwest where they have lots of salts, um, less rainfall, you kind of get an accumulation of alkaline substances. Uh, but really the, the kind of the point and the takeaway here is that judicious management of pH is critical because of all, you know, this soil availability of nutrients will really drastically change as pH changes. And like I said, that best balance is between six and seven. That's kind of our pretty close to neutral to very mildly acidic. So we use lime to buffer our soils. It's readily available. Um, you know, it's composed of calcium carbonate. So not only we do, do we buffer our soils, but we do add calcium, which is, uh, you know, helpful for our plants. And ultimately the goal is to just buffer our pH, to raise our pH. You know, basically what it does, uh, you take your, you add your lime and this calcium will kind of bump off these hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions are responsible for the acidity in the soil. So that calcium says, move, I'm gonna bind to this soil particle. The hydrogens end up, you know, free. They'll bond with some carbon, crave water, carbon dioxide and leave the system. Um, so again, notice you'll get extra calcium on your soil. You'll lose your hydrogens. 
Um, now we have more basic soil and a little bit more nutritious. This shows you the exact or a more exact uh, nutrient availability depending on our pH. Um, and again, this is really kind of extreme and shows you why it's so important to monitor pH. We have 100% availability of these fertilizer uh, nitrates, nutrients at 6.5. And as we decrease in pH, they become much, much less available. So if you're out there adding your, new, your fertilizer to a low or acidic pH field, none of that or very small portions of that are going to be actually available to the plants. Uh, and you're going to be an inefficient use of fertilizer. We also want to consider um, the depth when we talk about pH. So lime is not very mobile. When we apply it to the surface, it takes quite a long time to actually sink through the soil layer. So really, we're only going to be affecting the top few layers. And if we think about our different crop roots, you know, different roots grow in different fashions. Wheat and alfalfa, you end up really, really low. And so they'll be growing in soil conditions that we don't have as much control over. Um, so, you know, in a sense, it's less important or we're going to have less of an effect when we think about managing pH. Whereas if we look at a crop like corn, you have a lot more surface layer roots. It's going to be strongly affected by that surface layer, layer pH. Uh, okay, so then after you look at your pH, we're going to look at our extractable nutrients. Um, so we'll take the, the samples, we'll extract them in the lab, um, and we'll use a number of different methods to basically try to estimate how much of these nutrients are available to plants and how much will become available in the near future. Uh, so these are a number of common soil test extractants. Um, different extractants can be used to measure different nutrients. Um, and different extractants are used in different regions and are used to different effects. Um, these are the four that are most commonly used here in Maryland. Um, Malik 3 is a really, really good test. It's uh, really good at estimating phosphorus in particular, uh, but you'll also notice that it does a ton of other nutrients. Uh, something that's really important when you end up getting your results back is they will tell you which process they use to extract those nutrients, and that will be really important to interpreting the results. If you were given results for Malik 3 and you compared them to standards for Malik 1, it would not, the, the, those two values are not comparable, and you would end up not really understanding what's going on in the field. So there's a common misconception that when we think about soil and available nutrients, that there is a discrete portion of the soil nutrient that is available at a given time. Uh, the truth is that that doesn't really actually exist. It's much more about a spectrum of availability. On the available side, you know, we have soluble components. We have nitrate, potassium. Um, on the very unavailable side, you know, I think about Jesse's talk, we've got potassium wrapped up in rocks, phosphorus, things that are not going to become available very easily. Uh, and those things do change depending on the soil conditions. Uh, you know, you'll see more or less nutrients becoming available. So what our extractants do is they basically are able to pull out a certain fraction of the available nu nutrients in the soil. And then they kind of are correlated to what this plant can actually extract. So Malik 3, for example, will extract this much of the phosphorus that's in the soil pool. Um, and then we'll connect that to how much a plant can actually extract it. With Malik in particular, it's very close. So we're getting an estimate with these tests of how much uh, nutrient is available. That's kind of the, the real key takeaway. We can get lots of the details here, but that, that's the best. Um, another thing that we'll be looking at is cation exchange capacity. Um, kind of a big term, but at the end of the day, it's, it's self-explanatory. Um, you know, cations are kind of a, a class of nutrients that are important for plants. Um, and it, the exchange capacity is a measure of how good our soil is at one, binding and holding on to those cations so they remain in the soil, and then two, exchanging them with plants when plants need nutrients. If the soil becomes depleted, you know, how likely is your soil to be able to then donate these cations that it's bound to, to the plants. So a good cation exchange capacity is one that's high. So you would get, have a high ability to grab onto those particles and then a high ability to 
pass them back over to the, the plant producer. Uh, in addition to getting results for cation exchange capacity, you'll get something called base saturation. Um, basically what that is, is it takes all the cations, groups them together and says, okay, 70% of your cations are calcium, 10% are magnesium or manganese, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll get all of those results um, and you have to decide what they mean because on, on the surface, on paper, it's just numbers. Um, and that doesn't necessarily translate one-to-one -to, -one to action. Um, so what researchers have done is found a way to connect those test results to yield. Um, and that's the whole point, right? It's saying, okay, so you have this test result, and at that point, you will get 50% relative yield to a field that has, let's say, 100% phosphorus. Um, so that's where these results are really going to come in handy and how we need to translate, essentially, a result into you know, yield response. So this is a really common graph that we see when we're talking about yield response. Um, so this is our relative yield and this is our soil test level. So let's say we start at zero, we have zero of um, phosphorus in the soil. We're gonna get you know, basically zero yield compared to if we had the optimum level. So that's this relative yield is compared to the optimum soil level. As our soil test level increases, our relative yield increases. Up until right here, this is a really important point, the critical soil test level. Basically, after this point, any addition of that particular nutrient will not result in an increased yield. So this is the crux of this whole thing, is we want to find this optimum level, and we want to know how much nutrient we need to add to get to that optimum level. Anything less? and our yield won't be maximized anything more, we're wasting money, potentially polluting. Uh, that's just, it's not something that we want to be involved in. Uh, these categories are created differently in different states. This is University of, or State of Maryland's system. Um, they kind of came up with a fertility index value, which is just another way to quantify your soil variable. Um, and they put them into categories, low, medium, optimum, and excessive. The lower the number, generally, the more likely you are to get a response from an increase in nitrate or nutrients. So these low and medium categories, if you get test results here, that's saying if you add this particular nutrient, you're likely to see response. Um, so when we are doing this, you know, like I said, well, you can get a soil test fertility index value. Uh, you could get units reported in parts per million, you could get maybe Delaware's fertility index value system, or there's, there's a number of different ways to quantify. Um, another fact sheet that we have on the University of Maryland Extension page is a unit conversion fact sheet. Um, and this can be really helpful if you have maybe used a couple of different labs to analyze results and you want to compare the results, but they're in different units or they're in different uh, indexes. Uh, that, that resource is available for you as well. So now all of the results have been calculated. They're going to send you the test reports. Um, and on their faces, they can look pretty complicated. Um, so we're going to work through a couple of them just to kind of, you know, give you a sense that they're not actually that difficult to read. It's just a matter of stepping through part by part. So first, we have our different fields here. Uh, just kind of different names applied to them. Um, we have the lab numbers of where they were, like specific lab within this organization. The first thing we'll see is our organic matter um, given to us in percent rates. So you'll see that 1.9, 1.8, 1 1.6. Um, and then you'll see L here. So L is going to stand for, in this case, low. Um, you'll get a lot of these abbreviations next to your soil value to kind of give you two ways to look at it or to maybe make it a bit more interpretable, interpretable naturally. Um, so then we have extractable nutrients. So this was M3. So that's our malic 3 given to us in parts per million. Um, and then so we see 32 parts per million. This rate is that fertility index value of medium. Um, and then it gives you the Maryland value. So then you can use that to like convert into maybe other source or other uh, quantifiers. 
Um, and we'll see the same thing down the, down the row. Very high, very high, high. And that can be useful for just kind of general simple categorizations. Um, further down the list, we've got our potassium, our magnesium, our calcium, all reported in the same ways. You know, you want to take special note of what tests they were using to extract, um, what rates are, are being used, and then, of course, the units. Um, so those are all things that can get confusing, um, but if you just take it step by step and use the resources available, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, at the end here, we've got our cation exchange capacity. We have our percent base saturation. So this is kind of related to our cation exchange capacity. Uh, something that can be interesting that you'll see in more acidic soils is that your hydrogen percentage will be way higher. Um, in this particular soil, we have mostly calcium, uh, magnesium, and then potassium, and then very, very little hydrogen. So that's a pretty good test result for us. Uh, here is another form, you know, uh, different labs will use different visualizations, different organizations, but they're mostly going to give you all the same information just in different places. So, you know, here we have soil pH. Um, you often see this buffer pH. If you have a low pH, they will conduct a separate test to tell you basically how much lime you're going to need. Um, you can't get that from soil pH alone. So you'll have a target pH, a soil pH, and then this buffer pH, which is sort of like you're going to try to get there. There's some chemistry involved. Um, then we have all our extractable nutrients. In this case, um, we're not seeing like uh, parts per million or pounds per acre. We're just getting like an index value. So that'll be our index value, 25 L. So it's in the low category, 271 high, 217 very high, very high. Um, again, so there are similarities even across differences, um, but just being careful to acknowledge, okay, well, what system is this? Is this the system I use? Is this Maryland's recommendation system? Or do I need to convert this into something more understandable? Uh, again, percent-based saturation. And then oftentimes you'll get these, you should always get these recommendations that'll tell you, okay, well, here we need one ton per acre of lime. Um, and they noted that you're gonna need to add some phosphate and some potash. Uh, another thing to point out, um, is that sometimes they'll report phosphate, potash, or potassium just as uh, the raw elemental symbols. Sometimes you'll see them in this like fertilizer oxide form, uh, but they're always talking about the same thing. If a box is blank, does that mean they're written on or they didn't test for it? So probably that they didn't test for it. Um, like in this case, zinc and manganese are your kind of micronutrients. So they probably didn't include them or they were specifically asked to include them. Um, but like sulfur, boron, these are probably like additional services or tests that you would need to select when you send your sample in. Yeah. What is buffer pH? The buffer pH listed up there, is that your goal? No, so your target pH is 6.5. The buffer yeah. pH, yeah, going back to the intro to chemistry, there's that has to do with like, you, the, the pH of the buffer needed to get to this target pH, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they will, you know, this information will kind of be uh, interpreted into more, you know, standard, no nonsense recommendations of like, okay, so we're telling you this and that, but we're going to tell you to put this much lime. Yeah. But, and there will also be considerations for the lime you're using, the nutrient contents of that. Uh, but yeah. Um, Here's another example from Penn State. This one's much nicer to read. You can see they have their optimum categories set out. You have these nice bar graphs. Um, you can see the test levels right there, clearly listed in parts per million. Um, then we go straight into our recommendations. Uh, all this stuff, you know, again, pretty standard uh, topics. They'll just kind of show the data in different ways. Uh, so it's important to be familiar with these different kinds of sheets because you don't really know necessarily what your results will look like before you get them. Um, so you want to be able to kind of interpret, work through, and understand these result sheets uh, pretty well. So kind of piggybacking off of that, you know, these labs don't necessarily know you. They don't necessarily know your field. Um, so if I sent my sample to Iowa, they would base their recommendations off 
ION recommendations. And if I'm not aware that those recommendations or the soil tests that they use are not appropriate for my particular field, then I might not realize that these recommendations don't apply for me. So that's why as consultants, we need to understand all these steps in this process so that we can make sure we can fact check that these sheets are relevant to us um, and that the recommendations actually do make sense in our particular context. Um, and you know, all those things like the nutritional needs, the lime rates, sulfur of two alkaline, uh, soil contributions, local growing conditions, uh, method and timing, all of those things are kind of unique to the particular farmer or the field that we're talking about. Um, so again, just kind of hammering home on that point that we need to be fluent in understanding these sheets and being able to translate the recommendations or fact checking those recommendations. Um, so uh, just another slide to kind of reiterate that we'll see all these different forms, these results. We'll see fertility index values. We'll see parts per million, pounds per acres. Um, and it's really important to know which methods and units your lab is using, especially if you are comparing results from different labs. And I will, again, there is that conversion sheet um, and you can convert from parts per million to pounds per acre. You can convert a Malik 3 result into a Malik 1 result. However, that is sub ideal. You would most like to compare the exact same test from the exact same labs. That's ideal. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but in an ideal world, that will give you the best results. But you can and should, if you need to, do the conversion. Uh, so to kind of pull back and revisit everything that we've been talking about, uh, soil pH is really important. We need to manage that pH to make sure that we're staying in our ideal ranges. When it comes to soil sampling, the number of cores is really critical. We need to have enough cores to uh, you know, eliminate that natural variability so that we get accurate results. We also don't want to get so many cores that we end up overkilling it and spending a ton of time and money on efforts that aren't necessary. Um, and then we also have to consider the depth. Right? That's another really critical point. If we sample the wrong depth, um, that data is not really going to be very useful. And then when it comes to the reports, um, regular soil testing is critical for diagnosing problems. Um, and then the, the soil test results themselves are not that complicated. We just you know, had to go over all these different ways of displaying and interpreting that data. Of the take homes, um, soil variability is the number one source of error in soil testing. Um, so again, that's, it's really important when you set out there to collect these soils that you have a plan, um, that your plan matches your particular needs and the characteristics of the field, um, and that you're ready to follow through uh, and really make sure that that is done to the best of your ability. Uh, you wanna make sure that the laboratories you're using are using relevant soil testing methods. Um, remember, don't send it to Iowa, don't send it to California. Um, and then when it comes to interpreting and understanding those reports, you want to make sure that it's all based on your local regional field calibrations. Uh, and that's all kind of wrapped up in just being knowledgeable about these reports, understanding the differences, um, and being able to you know, take that information and turn it into useful applications, practical procedures. Uh, so a few words about manure. Uh, this presentation kind of goes into some scenarios uh, and doesn't touch as much on the sampling protocols, uh, but I will try to introduce some of that information as it's kind of relevant. Uh, but and not to spend too much time on this because as we've talked about it a lot. But nutrients uh, or fertilizer as a nutrient source is complex. Um, we have a mix of different metabolic wastes um, depending on the animals that we're taking the manure from. We'll have different nitrogen nutrient forms. Um, and then when it comes to feces, we have, you know, you've got up undigested feed, as we were saying earlier, very inefficient process. You end up with a lot of different nutrients left over. You can have microbodies, you can have cell wall debris, the animal gut. So we have this really mixed bag of nutrients. And then within that, the chemical structure, the chemical reactions, uh, we'll have very soluble nutrients. We'll have nutrients that will need to break down before they could be used. 
Um, we have more stable organic nutrient forms. Um, and then we'll even have some mineral forms. So when it comes to thinking about applying this, we have to take that into consideration. Uh, so the big thing with manure when it comes to application is that we don't get these really nice proportional um, descriptions of the nutrients that are involved. Uh, so when it comes to matching our nutrient ratios to our crops, a particular manure might not be the best fit. So that's where the sampling comes in. We can understand the nutrient compositions of our manures with proper sampling protocols. Uh, when it comes to solid manures, you know, depending on your storage, you really just want to make sure that you're getting a representative sample. Again, the same kind of logic applies from soil sampling to manure sampling. You don't want to sample the exterior of the pile only. You don't want to get to the top and just take a couple of scoops. You want to be sampling from different locations within the pile, mixing those samples together, and then sending them to the lab. So really want it to be very well mixed so that it's representative. Same thing goes for liquid manure. If you have some kind of holding tank with an agitator, that's great because you can mix the liquid manure prior to sampling. If you don't, you get stratification. You can have watery layers on top. Um, some kind of like really viscous nutrient rich sludges on the bottom and then things in between. And if you're only sampling one of those layers, you won't understand what your nutrient ratios are. And then when it comes to applying, um, it will be very hard to uh, control and meet your needs. Um, so again, this is all information that we've kind of already gone over today. There are just a lot of different questions about manure. Um, and while manure is incredibly useful and a great natural resource, uh, we, we need to know the answers to these questions if we want to be really responsible and really effective with its use. Um, another plug for extension, there is all sorts of information on calibrating your spreading equipment. Um, that can help you understand once you have your nutrient ratios from your, your uh, sampling, then you can make some good predictions or good calculations on how much you're gonna put over your fields. So we just have a couple scenarios. I'll try to breeze through them. Um, basically each one of these bars represents the crop needs. And then the orange represents what our manure is actually giving us. Uh, so in this case, we would need you know, 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen, 78 of potassium and zero phosphorus. And when we inject our dairy liquid at these nutrient concentrations, we're ending up with you know, a good chunk of our nitrogen, more phosphate than we need, and about half as much potash. Um, so really, this is a pretty useful um, or a pretty good application of manure. We do need to supplement, uh, but we're only adding a little extra phosphate, and uh, our potash numbers are good too. Another scenario, similar, but this time we have different uh, nutrient content in our fertilizer. And we end up adding a little bit too much phosphate, a little too much potassium, um, but we really hit our nitrogen right on the head. So again, a pretty good application. And then finally, this is a, a more extreme example of where manure is not necessarily the best fertilizer or nutrient source. Uh, with our poultry litter, we have really high concentrations of phosphorus and potassium, uh, but we don't really need that much material. So we end up with all of this extra phosphor fertilizer where we don't need it. Uh, and bringing it back to the sampling, you know, this kind of uh, scenario and calculation is only possible when you have reliable numbers for your manure that you've collected. Uh, so just, again, this was the best case scenario. We didn't really waste uh, or add too much. Um, and we were able to supplement a lot of the nutrient needs with that manure. Kind of summing all that up, take our representative samples, mix them well, um, and then keep an eye on your soil FIVP levels. So if you're using manure, you want to be, you know, definitely checking in regularly to make sure that you're not you know, building up a ton of phosphorus. Uh, calibrate your equipment, keep ref records of your application rates. Um, this, this is all just going into this kind of responsible use of manure. Uh, that's very much linked to sampling uh, and calibrating. Uh, and then, you know, this is, you know, there's no real single easy answer to incorporation. 
Um, but if you do incorporate, you're less likely to lose nitrogen, so that's a consideration. Um, corn fields are especially good for manure with their high nitrogen uh, requirements. Um, and then just you know use best judgment, look around for best management practices. There's all these resources that we're providing. Uh, and all that will help you use manure responsibly. Any questions? Thank you very much.